Hello. So we are live now. People are joining in slowly. Yes. Uh, can Can you check for Dr. Vimpni and uh, uh, Brigu? And also... yes, I have added uh, Dr. Vimpni already. I am checking for the other people. Yeah. And uh, K. Rafi. Yes. On mute. Hello. Oh. Hi, this is this is Professor Wimpenny. Hi. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, who's, thank you. Who's on the call so far? I guess we've got delegates joining, but yes. So Brigu, I and uh, Mr. Rafi, he'll be joining in. Yeah. And Good. We have we have almost twenty attendees already joined in. Okay. So, yes. Good morning, David. Hello. Who's that? Uh, Brigo. Hello, Brigo. Long time no talk. Yeah, it's been a really long time. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, reasonably given the circumstances. You know, it's not uh, it's not ideal for doing business at the moment, but you know, uh, we have to uh, what's that? Knuckle down at the moment until uh, until the uh, current problems blown over. How's things in how's things true, in India? Uh, um, slow. Um, manufacturing industry overall, it's still reviving from the lockdown. Yeah. Um, so it's going to take some time. Uh, Sanka, can you can you add uh, uh, Dr. Rafi also? Uh, Brigu. Yes, sir. Just. Brigu. Yeah. Can, can yeah. you start? Sh can you start sharing your screen? Yeah. Just a second. Uh, yes, so we have everyone now in the house. So everyone is uh, here. It's Rocky and uh, Hello. 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 Good afternoon and good morning. Yes. Good evening to you. Thank you. Yes. Is um, it... Sankha, can you give me screen sharing rights, please? Uh, yes, sir. Done. Okay. Can you see the presentation now? Not yet. No, uh, can you sorry, uh, restart? Just restart the screen sharing process. Okay, okay, just a second. So I'm leaving the meeting and joining in again. Uh, Sankha, I'm uh, logged in from my mobile as well and from my desktop. Oh, okay, okay. So should I put a different email address in my desktop login? Uh, no, the same thing as well. Uh, if you're if you're doing through desktop, you can actually uh, just uh, right now again you can re you can re-share your screen. The screen sharing option will be available right now. You don't have to leave the webinar. Okay. Okay. Hi, David. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so, um, David, this is uh, Khalid Rafi. I think we haven't uh, spoken yet. No. Or, you're, you're, or you're, 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 the, you're the ASTM man in, in, um, in Singapore. Yes. And myself and Alex, um, Alex Liu. Yeah. I know Alex. I've met Alex. Uh, okay. So, and I think we... I don't, I don't, I, I'd be amazed we've not met at some stage, but I might be wrong on that. Uh, yes, so uh, we had been to multiple meetings, but we couldn't get a chance to meet face to face so far. No, it's been one of those things. I've, I've been very busy. My colleagues have been attending meetings, but um, yeah, 
you know, I, I don't mind traveling. It's just, just not had the, the, um, the bandwidth just recently. Yeah. I know that you have uh, frequent meetings with uh, Maddie. Yeah. I, I try and attend those. I like to see if my colleagues are doing what they're promising to do, okay. or whether they are letting me down. So, um, okay. In simple terms. Yeah. Yeah. Rigu, are you able to share your screen? Uh, no, not yet. I'll try mine. So. Blum, blum, blum. Yeah, I'm now uh, sharing my screen. Uh, can you guys see my screen now? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, so now I go to full mode. Sorry. Uh, okay, see, so yeah, it's moving around. So uh, now I'm in presenter view, but I still can see only my single slide, right? You are not seeing my. Uh, uh, slide or, or sidebar. Um, okay. I can... okay, I think now it's only uh, my first slide, right? So let me start by introduction. Uh, so today uh, uh, we will be doing a webinar on uh, uh, the standard certification and collaborative approach in AM. So my name is Ankit Sahu. So good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from the various parts of the Dr. Khalid Rafi and uh, Dr. David Bimpney, along with uh, Rigu Auja, uh, who is the CTO at Objective. And myself, I'm hosting this webinar today. Uh, so. So today is a very interesting topic on the developments on standard certification and collaborative approaches in AM. And, uh, and previously we did uh, in, the, in the same series, uh, we did uh, Innovators at Home. That was in April. So on, in the first lockdown, we were able to uh, gather some information, gather some momentum on uh, understanding the AM technology. Then uh, previously in the month of May, we discussed a lot about the new technologies, the application side of the technologies uh, from Confirmer Cooling, which is one of the great services which uh, Additive has been providing to the molding, molding uh, uh, agencies. And uh, then we talked about topology optimization. And now after that, we spoke on the last Friday on uh, AM in the power sector. And there we were joined by uh, great people from Siemens, uh, from Flowserve, from Extrude Hohn and DNV GL. And uh, so so, uh, so today will be our last for, for this series. And we'll be talking about the standard certification and collaborative approaches in AM. And uh, so today's host will be Ms. Mr. Brigu Auja from Objectify. So, Brigu, you can take it over. Um, me. Thank you, Ankit. Um, next slide, please, Sankha. Uh, so, today we'll be basically focusing on uh, the need to bridge the gap between academic research and commercial applications. Uh, in our experience at Objectify, there is the standard uh, machine material process details, but what is really missing 
is the research knowledge, the academic research knowledge, and how it can be incorporated into a commercial application. So for this, um, the webinar really focuses on two aspects. The standards that have been developed considering the basic knowledge and how they are a guide for commercial applications. And on the uh, second side, uh, Professor David Wimpany will talk about the concept of technology development centers and how they help to bring in the research and the application together. Um, so looking forward to the presentation from share your screen and start the presentation. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to share my screen right now. I believe all of you can see my screen. Uh, sir, I would just like to introduce you to our viewers. Yep. Um, Dr. Khalid Rafi is the Senior Manufacturing Program Development Lead for ASTM AM Center of Excellence. In his role, he works closely with AM Center of Excellence to develop programs on AM education and workforce development and programs on standardization and certification. He holds master's and PhD in metallurgical and materials engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Prior to joining ASTM, Dr. Rafi was the global technical lead for additive manufacturing programs, materials and processes at Underwriters Laboratories, UL. He was a key contributor to UL AM training program, development of UL Blue Card program for plastics in AM, and an establishing qualification program for metal additive manufacturing. He has co-authored over 25 publications in peer-reviewed international journals and has made over 30 presentations in conferences, symposiums, and trade shows. Please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Khaled Rafi from ASTM. Over to you, sir. Hi, Brick. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon, all, and thank you very much for joining this session. So uh, today's presentation is focusing more on the progress on uh, standards, certification, and what's happening in the collaborative uh, approach for R&D manufacturing. So in the next uh, 20 minutes, I'll be uh, sharing uh, um, some details about uh, um, how the how standards are impacting additive manufacturing and um, how uh, we can use standards for uh, uh, industrializing additive manufacturing and how the research and development can uh, support it. Next slide. I'm trying. I'm finding some issues here in moving the slides. I just uh, stop my sharing and uh, redo it. I think that can fix the problem. Dr. Rafi, everything is all right? Yeah, but um, uh, one second. Yes, yeah. No, all I'm right. Good. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I was trying to um, give you a, a brief introduction about what I was going to do before. Um, so, I'll be giving you a small introduction about ASTM standards, so why we need these standards, and um, how we can implement these additive manufacturing standards into AM ecosystem, and uh, how we can further. Uh, uh, speed up the standardization process by um, research and development. So, why we need uh, standards? Why we need AM additive manufacturing standards? So, essentially, um, additive manufacturing is no more a prototyping technology. It is now more like an industrialization um, into an industrialization mode, which means. Uh, we need specialized 
well-defined procedures to do um, at the manufacturing activities. So before going into those details, let me introduce uh, what ASTM is and um, what we are doing uh, from a standard perspective. So ASTM International is, a, is an international um, standard development body and uh, we have uh, standards fr uh, from oil and gas industry to construction and in, and spread into wide varieties of industries and we have more than 12,800 standards um, so far developed and used widely across the world. It's not based on the US alone. If you can see more than 60% of the standards are currently used outside the US and uh, it's applied in more than uh, 90 plus industry sectors. And uh, ASTM International have uh, more than 30,000 committee members and we leverage uh, the technological know-how of these committee members for developing the uh, standards and we have more than 140 different technical committees who are working on uh, developing multiple standards. So this is a very snapshot of what um, ASTM is. As we move on, I can share you much more details. So yeah, when it comes to IRD manufacturing standards, like any other technology for IRD manufacturing as well, we need um, standards to move through. So now almost in all industry sectors, IRD manufacturing is at the tipping point of adoption. So we need standards, we need qualification processes, we need certification. So what standards can do is it can um, ensure process control, can give you an assurance of your quality, it can define different levels of criticality, it can reduce the risk quite a bit, and uh, by that, it can reduce the cost and drive the larger option of RD manufacturing. Also, another two important aspects is to impart this and it can also provide support for certification and uh, quality assurance. So um, when we look into RD manufacturing standards, uh, one of the important aspect was to uh, see what are all the standards needed to drive the industry. So RD manufacturing um, standard is called RD manufacturing standardization collaborative. It was um, a collaborative effort between ANSI and America Mix. So they categorized uh, different areas in energy manufacturing, the design process, qualification, non-destructive evaluation and maintenance. And they found more than 90 plus priority, 51 with uh, medium priority and 24 with low priority. And out of all, they also uh, found that more than 65 such gaps needs uh, R&D or research and development to uh, move further. So filling those standard gaps are not easy because as you know, R&D manufacturing is a relatively uh, new technology and uh, it has boomed in the past few years. So we don't have enough data to uh, look upon. And, uh, from all the uh, people involved in it and multiple organizations are working on the standards that could cause a I mean, potential duplication as well as overlap of what we are working on and uh, we also need research and development as well as uh, resources to do validation experiments so these are all the things which limits uh, uh, the standard if you look into the current uh, additive manufacturing standard landscape there are about 25 plus standards published by ISO and ASTM together. And uh, there are another 50 plus standards currently under development. You can categorize these uh, available standards into three, four buckets, like a general added manufacturing standards, then application specific standards, feedstock material standards, process and equipment related standard. The And in other organizations are also actively involved in developing these AM standards uh, specifically for their uh, industry sectors. When it comes to certification, um, based on an, ana an analysis before, one of the major hurdles that RD manufacturing industrialization is going to face is in terms of certification. If you see for the next 10 years, certification of finished parts and products, then quality and standardization of material. In
and the quality of dumpling blocks that we need to face when we look into the industrialization of additive manufacturing. And uh, this can be uh, addressed uh, at different levels. It can be from international bodies, national agencies, um, different end users and uh, uh, organizations like that. But for certifications, uh, the most important thing that we need is uh, the standards. So at the moment, there are no broad certification frameworks, even though there are uh, certification programs started and it is not complete, it is not provided prevent uh, certification. Any organization want to provide such kind of an end to end solution, definitely we need uh, enough standards which can address the So what to help accelerate additive manufacturing in all industries? It's not specific aerospace or specific to uh, medical, but it, it um, consider all different industry for additive manufacturing. And, uh, The additive manufacturing footprint at AST time, the first additive manufacturing um, standard committee started. Uh, F42 and AST also have collaborative agreements from different standard development organizations, and one of the notable one is the a partnership stand. I mean, partnership is DON with ISP. 261, which just happened back in 2013. And in fact, this collaboration was a strategic one because it drives the RD manufacturing standard development process in a much faster pace, 25 standards out right now. And in addition to the collaboration with different uh, standard development organizations, ASTM also have uh, um, collaborative efforts with the NASA, NIST, FAA, FAA, uh, MMPDS, and organizations like that. So a quick fact about this ASTM F42 committee, which makes uh, standard development is that, as I said before, it started in 2009, and we have more than 800 uh, plus involved in it. And uh, 25 plus standards has been uh, so far published, and uh, 50, plus, 50 plus is under development. So if you see the structure of these uh, ASTM F42 committee, it comes of uh, multiple committees called test methods, design, material and process, uh, in environment, health and science applications and data. So data is the latest one added to this. Uh, you can see who are all the one who lead this effort. So these are all the different subcommittees and all the subcommittees are led by uh, industry leaders or from here, such institutes. So uh, all these committees right now start from F4201 to F4207. These are all the ones which are currently active and F4208, as I said before, is the new committee started for data. And this is the standard development structure followed by ASTM and uh, ISO Chugata. So this is developed by um, ISO ASTM as a roadmap towards development of standards in the coming years. So you can see there are three tiers in developing the standard. The first one is the general or the top level A standards, which means it can be ap applied across any industry, across any process. So it is process agnostic or uh, material agnostic. When you go down further, it becomes uh, category based more uh, towards the process and equipment and finished parts. And at the, at the top level, you can see that uh, uh, the standards are developed for very specific applications or, or very specific industry. This is the approach and ISO is following uh, in developing the standards. And an important aspect uh, here is, uh, uh, apart from other uh, subcommittees, there is an, uh, uh, there's a very important subcommittee under ASTM that is called F47. Needed a different um, subsections to this committee, ranging from A, products. So we also add uh, another uh, subsection to this based on the from the uh, industry sector. So this is driven by the industry. So if you see these subsections, all these subsections are industry and they know the real need for the industry. So to an AM process chain. We know that at the Manufacturing process is a complex one. 
it is similar to any other technology, but it is complex because of uh, the involvement in multiple uh, stages of the additive manufacturing process. And each stage of the additive manufacturing process got uh, potential uh, uh, variabilities, whether it is design or feedstock or material and process or post processing, we need tighter control in all these stages. So if you see the standards currently under development, all those standards which are under development or which are published already, they are all focusing on each and every uh, stages of this additive manufacturing process. So here it, it's a, um, uh, again, a snapshot of uh, different uh, standards currently published. So what most of the standards you are seeing here is uh, already published. And if you can see um, different standard, I put it in, in different buckets. To start with, if you are an experienced person or new to the manufacturing industry, the first standard that you should look upon is uh, the ASTM, ISO ASTM 5290. Uh, techniques that you can have in For using additive manufacturing. Similarly, for environment and health and science, there are two standards currently under development that you publish. Uh, these standards talks about um, what are all the safety uh, requirements that you should follow within an additive manufacturing facility. Similarly, for equipment and software, there's a standard called 52915, which talks about the additive manufacturing file format. So these are all some of the typical examples of the standards currently available, which can be used for uh, different phases of your additive manufacturing uh, process. And uh, uh, again, when it comes to material, there are some material uh, specific standards or material specifications, uh, particularly for additive manufacturing additive manufacturing materials. So you can see all these materials, like titanium or inconel, they are all having material specs in our conventional manufacturing, but the specs that you can see here is basically a targeted to additively manufactured uh, component. So when you are looking for, um, let's say a finished part in uh, cobalt chrome, then you should look for ASTM F F3213 to see what are all the uh, standard specification that you need to meet when you uh, produce a part using cobalt chrome. So these are all the material standards right now available under um, uh, ASTM. Then uh, qualification is another important uh, aspect. So we have a lot of standards out there, but how we are going to use these standards uh, for a meaningful purpose, for, uh, for a qualification of your facility. So this is a list of uh, standards which you can uh, consider to qualifying your process. For example, you can have uh, ISA STM 52930. Uh, this is uh, about to publish, maybe within one or two uh, months, you may be seeing the publication of the standard. It's currently under ballot. And another one is ASTM 52941, that is to check the system performance and uh, reliability. This is also going to publish soon. Now it is in a, in a draft international standard form. And uh, 52904, which I mentioned before, can be used for. Uh, qualifying your, your process itself, and that standard is already published. And uh, ISO STM 52902, the standard is about to assess the capability of your machine by using test artifacts. And one more standard that you can look for is 52920, it is not yet published. It is a new work item proposal uh, that is basically on uh, qualification principles for an additive manufacturing site. So if you have these uh, three to four standards in the beginning, I think uh, this is the first step towards qualifying your process in your, in your premises. 
So now we move on to uh, the collaborative part of RD manufacturing. So we have seen uh, the standard development side of thing and how we are going to um, drive the standard development with some collaborative efforts. So uh, keeping that in mind, ASTM has come out with a, with a unique um, um, activity called RD manufacturing center of excellence. So what the center of excellence do is it bridges the gap between standard development and uh, uh, um, the collaborative activity. So we know that uh, standard development is a consensus-based process and it takes long time since we don't have enough data out. Um, there are delays in getting it done. So main aim for the ASTM COE is to support that part. So ASTM COE supports uh, the uh, standard development activity through research and development by collaborating with ASTM COE partners. Then, um, so there's a clear distinction between the ASTM F42 committee as well as ASTM COE. So ASTM F42 committee is purely for making a uh, consensus-based standard in collaboration with the uh, ISO TC261 at this moment. And ASTM AMCOE is mainly for providing a platform for collaborative partnerships with the different stakeholders from uh, the ASTM F42 committee members, as well as from the AM community in general. So ASTM AMCOE provides a link between the ASTM F42 committee with uh, the rest of the AM community. And these are some of the research uh, activities that we are currently uh, progressing with to support different uh, standard development activities. You can see that we have design data and modeling, feedstock, AM processes and AM testing and qualification. All those things are linked to some of these um, committees like uh, F4201 test methods and or F4204 and design and things like that. So all these research uh, activities are in one way or other support the standard development activities. So if you, hear, if you see here, this is a typical example of how the past research has uh, um, supported the standard development. So we have uh, two rounds of projects so far completed. And uh, if you see, uh, these projects are directly impacting the existing standard as well as it addresses the standard gaps. So we can see all these uh, institutions over here. So these are all the partners for uh, research and development for uh, RD manufacturing with ASTM. So MTC is our partner at UK. NAMIC is the partner at uh, Singapore. It covers the Asia part as well. And we have uh, University of Auburn, um, EWI, and uh, NASA. They're all the partners back in US. So with their support, we are doing this research and development and make sure that this can directly impact or drive the standard development activities. And so we have the two ways of supporting the uh, research and development. So one is called a request for ideas, which means it is basically uh, from the ASTM committee members. So once we have those ideas, we will uh, you take the ideas and uh, uh, do research projects with our partners, with our AMCA partners. The next one is the, it's a new one that's called call for project. This is now open to the entire AM community. So who is having an idea which can a research idea which can support and uh, support towards standard development? You can propose a project, um, and if it is in alignment with uh, the standard development process, then we will um, uh, fund that particular project. And you can you can get involved with ASTM in multiple ways. One is, as I said, through these R&D projects, and you can also uh, be a part of the work item development, which can be initiated for the ASTM F42 standard development. And there are a lot of CO events happening, and there are other mechanisms as well, which we are exploring to have a better engagement with uh, or better collaboration with the AM community. So he, these are some of the activities that do at uh, ASTM. We have webinar series, we have um, a virtual workshop happening, uh, snapshot workshop. Uh, all these uh, activities are mainly to disseminate the knowledge that we are uh, gaining from the R&D activities, as well as the research and development happening at different uh, R&D organizations in US and elsewhere in the world. So uh, as a summary, what I want to say here is that uh, standards are key for industrialization, industrialization of AM, it is key for uh, regulations for wire adoption of the technology. 
and we need relevant high quality standards that regulators and certification bodies can adopt with high level of confidence. And um, we also need the involvement of R&D manufacturing stakeholders in standard development process to, to address the real needs because that's a key point because uh, uh, only people who are in the industry know what is the real requirement. And for accelerated standard development, R&D initiatives are, are very crucial. Yeah, that's all from me. I know that it was a bit um, faster, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Brigo? Um, thank you, Dr. Khalid, for the interesting presentation. Um, I would just like to start some question answers now. Okay. Uh, one of the questions we received um, talks about how the ASTM um, collaborates with other various national and international standardization agencies in the field of additive manufacturing. Could you throw some light on that? Okay, so uh, when it comes to collaboration, uh, I would again point back to the, the strategic collaboration between ASTM and ISO in developing additive manufacturing standards. So this is the only place I would say that uh, there's a uh, common standard coming out with the tag of both ISO and ASTM. So that's the first uh, um, kind of collaboration that we have. And now the collaboration can be in, in two ways. For example, um, whatever standard ISO and ASTM is, is developing, that standard can be adopted to uh, the national uh, bodies. Like for example, in in Germany, we have DIN, so DIN will be taking care of some of our adopting some of the standards by ISO and ASTM. And we have a SEN committee for Europe, we have a BES for um, UK. And uh, in, in the reverse way, which means these national standard bodies also create some standards which are uh, really applicable for um, an in or it can be scaled up towards an international level. So uh, ISO ASTM will also look on those standards and use that standard as a basis to create uh, international uh, standards. So this means the collaboration between uh, both uh, um, ISO and ASTM and with national standard bodies, these two are uh, interrelated or it goes back and forth. That's one thing. Second level of collaboration is to make sure that we are not doing any duplication in the work. For example, if ISO ASTM develop a standard, if the same standard is developed by some other standard organization, then there is a possibility of duplication. So we have a license uh, with a different standard organizations to make sure that uh, uh, there is no overlap of, uh, of standards for the same topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, another question that has been posted is about um, fundamentally in the standards perspective and the focus perspective, what is the difference between the standards you develop for metal versus the ones that you develop for polymer-based additive manufacturing processes? I would say in principle, there is no difference, whether it is metal or, or polymer, uh, the standard development process procedures, everything else. The only uh, thing that you are seeing here is most of the standards published are basically metal focused. The reason is because uh, all these standards uh, that you're seeing out are uh, developed based on the inputs from the industry. So if you see a couple of years, I mean, uh, one year back or so, most of the interest was towards um, uh, metal additive and uh, polymer was a low hanging fruit. But now we have seen that there are um, renewed interest in polymers, which, uh, which can be used for industrial applications. So there is a drive towards developing standards for a polymer. And um, right now in ASTM, ISO ASTM, there's a committee called F4205 on materials and process. And there is a work group which specifically work on uh, polymer additive manufacturing standards. And uh, if you see, there are a few standards which are already published for um, uh, polymers. For example, ISO ASTM 52903, that's a standard for extrusion based processes. Also, you can see the standard ISA STM 52911 part two, that is for uh, design uh, requirements for PEBF of polymers. So there are a few polymer standards, but if you compare with the number of standards out there for metal, 
it's not that much, but uh, you can expect a few standards coming out soon on Polymer side as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question that has been posted is uh, to say that as additive manufacturing is a relatively young technology with its fundamental understanding still evolving, how quickly and effectively is the state of the art research incorporated in an existing standard or to develop a new standard for that matter? Yeah, absolutely. Additive manufacturing, uh, I won't say young, but it is now uh, getting matured and it is at the tipping point of adoption at multiple um, industry sectors. Um, and uh, and as, a, as we mentioned before, one of the main hurdles is when you come up with a standard, specifically when you go for um, a very, uh, what, do you, what do you call, a specification, when you look for a specification kind of a standard, you need uh, real data to support those uh, requirements. So since already manufacturing uh, don't have much of a historical data, that's a challenge. But um, that's the reason why we are now coming up with these R&D initiatives. So organizations like MTC in the UK and uh, so many other research uh, organizations are working uh, towards it and we can certainly use those R&D outcomes as an input to um, standards and all other uh, R&D uh, happenings elsewhere in the world can also be used. So that's why I'm saying that you know, uh, all the R&D manufacturing stakeholders can be involved in the R&D manufacturing standard development process. It is not closed. It's not a closed door activity. It's an open door activity. Anybody can um, chime in at any time if you have a real uh, R&D, uh, which can be supported towards uh, standard development. So definitely R&D is going to be there and we are uh, um, you know, strongly supporting it and driving it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your questions. There are a lot of other questions and I'm sure we'll uh, forward you those questions. Um, but uh, due to time constraints, I would like to thank you for your lovely presentation. Um, and um, now we would uh, move to our second presentation by Thank Professor you very much. David Wimpany. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Um, I would like to introduce um, Professor David Wimpany. Professor Wimpany is the chief technologist and has been involved in AM research for over 30 years, establishing additive manufacturing research groups at both Warwick and De Montfort universities before joining the newly constructed Manufacturing Technology Center in Coventry in 2011, where he set up the NetShape and Additive Manufacturing Research Team, which has grown to be one of the largest activities in the MTC. Driven by demand from some of the world's leading industrial organization, in 2014, the MTC was awarded the status as the National Center for Additive Manufacturing David sits on the UK's AM Strategy Committee and is the author of over 90 publications in the field of AM and is an honorary professor at Nottingham University. Please join me, join me in welcoming Professor David Wimpany. Um, good morning. Good morning. Sir. Good morning. Hi, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm just going to get uh, started with. Uh, with this so give me a second okay okay hopefully everyone can see my slides uh yes we can okay brilliant uh, i'll just mute myself so that there is clarity in the audio no problem. Do you, David. okay so to good morning from and good afternoon and evening from the various parts of the world um what i'm going to do is basically do a presentation on, on how we link the research we do to real end applications and how we see commercialization. But I'll start by explaining a little bit about what the Manufacturing Technology Center does to provide you with context. Some of you may well have visited, I, I have hosted a number of visits from Indian delegations, uh, industrial delegations over the years. So a bit of background to the MTC. Um, this is the, the sort of MTC campus. Um, it was opened in 2011 um, and I joined February 2012, but I was actually working 
um, from that, that Christmas of 2011, trying to build up the activity. Um, it's an independent research technology organization, and it's, it was set up to bridge the value of death, linking brilliant research undertaken by universities around the world and what industry needs. You know, industry wants really robust processes, what we refer to as uh, high technology readiness level um, uh, you know, uh, technology, not, not um, research that's still in the laboratory. And that's a missing link, not just in the UK, but in many countries. Um, we need to prove innovative manufacturing ideas and also develop manufacturing system solutions. And that's the difference there is, is the all encompassing uh, system. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And very importantly, support industry with training. And we were established with four uh, founding research partners, University of Birmingham, Loughborough University, University of Nottingham, and also the Wells Institute. And we have a membership organization. We have members from across different sectors, large companies like Rolls-Royce and Airbus, down to very small companies, micro SMEs, just starting their journey, um, commercial journey. Our primary markets are aerospace, defense and security, construction, uh, space, transport, uh, food and drink, healthcare, and uh, utilities uh, and oil and gas. Um, quite a diverse uh, range of sectors, and it's interesting to see the dynamics between working in the aerospace sector compared to working in food and drink. Uh, food and drink want developments in days um, maximum weeks, and the aerospace sector um, has to take its time to ensure that it's got safe um, uh, products that don't don't cause crashes on, on on aircraft. And so there's a slight difference between different sectors. The Manufacturing Technology Centre is involved in a number of different manufacturing techniques, and they're they're grouped into uh, three strands: component manufacturing which is the area that, that I'm involved with, and that covers additive manufacturing, uh, non-conventional machining, things like EDM and ECM, and also uh, high integrity fabrication, a lot of it around welding. Um, and, and then also assembly systems, so tooling and fixturing, electronics, uh, robotics and autom autonomous systems, and then data. Data is really important, and that's around design and simulation, uh, manufacturing informatics, which is critical now, dr drawing data from manufacturing processes to optimize their performance. And then also metrology and NDT. And interestingly, within the National Center, we draw on all this capability. So although the additive manufacturing uh, group itself is relatively small, it's only less than 100 people, it draws on world-class experts across all of these different groups to deliver um, uh, projects which industry can can rely upon. So, for example, um, metrology and NDT is critical for our work in, in developing high-performance AM components to ensure that they are uh, uh, have high integrity. So, this is the we're part of the high-value manufacturing catapult, which was modelled on the Fraunhofer system in Germany. Um, and there's a number of centers around the UK. And in fact, additive manufacturing is represented in some way at many of these centers, um, right from the FRC in, the, in Scotland, Center for Press Innovation um, in, in, in the Northeast of England. We have the Nuclear MRC and AMRC based in, in Rotherham in, in Sheffield. Um, WMG, uh, where I used to work years ago um, at Warwick University. Uh, the National Composite Centre down in Bristol, and of course the Manufacturing Technology Centre um, in, in Coventry. And, um, and as, as, as Brigger has already mentioned in, in, in the, 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 this, the uh, opening, um, we're also the National Centre of Manufacturing um, in the UK. So in addition to that, we're, we're also ESAS, European Space Agency's AM Benchmarking Centre, since 2017, um, ESA recognised that 
additive is is such a new technology that to try and generate a consistent approach um, to to projects in AM, it needed it needed one air one center to ensure that, for example, feedstocks that go into the machines were treated in the same controlled manner. Otherwise, um, the, the research would be invalid. And, and we play a very important role in that. And our, our current contract has now been extended to 2022. And of course, we are um, the, uh, a partner within the, a founding partner within the ASTM uh, Center of Excellence um, alongside, and there are um, more partners now, I have to apologize, but this has been a, a moving target. There's been more, more people recruited and, and uh, since, since this slide was generated. So what do we do? Well, we're, we're the UK's independent AM body supporting supply chain. So we're not doing research as you would see in a university. We're not, that, that's, that's already been catered for. What we're interested in is taking new manufacturing techniques like AM into manufacturing, into companies making parts and making profits uh, for, for industry. So, you know, one of the things we can do, because we've been through this process with big companies, is to help companies follow that journey. You know, many companies are interested in additive manufacturing, but it's quite daunting. And we can say, look, we've had this experience. We can share this with you and say this is probably the approach for you that's, that's worth taking. We can also help companies who are into additive already um, mature their processes and, and streamline their processes. And very importantly, help with workforce competency. Because one of the things um, we find is that if we have a new technology like additive manufacturing, the number of experts are very, very small. And, and that means that the skill level within industry um, is, 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 is a shortage of skills. And we need to help bridge that. So we've got some excellent facilities, and for those that have visited, you'll, you'll know um, how well equipped we are. And we're always adding new, um, new technologies, new expertise. One of the disadvantages with AM is that every week, a new machine is launched in the world. So no one can, can, keep in, can have every machine. There would, there's not enough money and not enough space for any one center to have all of the equipment. We do really well, but it is a, a challenge to keep on top of new technology, even for us. Um, and, and, and that's important in, in helping industry. Another thing is to cover the whole process chain. So we tend to get focused on additive manufacturing as a process, but we need to consider things like design for AM, how we control the materials going into the machines, uh, particularly because many of the machines, the materials have to be recycled um, to be used in the next process. And that control of the reuse is critical. Also, part setup and parameter selection makes a significant impact on the likelihood of, of a process finishing correctly and, and good parts being produced. And then there's all of the, the sort of uh, processes after you've made the parts, you know, heat treat the finishing and very critically the part inspection um, but I'll explain a little bit about that uh, in a second. So you say we've got some good facilities, we've got metals, lots of metals machines, both powder bed machines, also adding now binder jetting technology because we see that as a route through to higher volume production and also large-scale directed energy um, what, what is often referred to as WAM technology, wire and arc AM, and also laser um, uh, uh, DED facilities for making large components, you know, uh, uh, measured in meters rather than millimeters. We also have a, uh, a, a, an excellent polymers area. And I, I think as, uh, uh, as mentioned previously, um, polymers, um, have taken a backseat a little bit in terms of end use components. However, we're seeing now a strong pull from industry for high performance polymers for some applications. So, and, and that's been a, a pretty interesting development over the last um, few years. 
And we're even seeing now ceramics coming through. Uh, and we have in the UK, there's two ceramic production facilities for AM. Um, so it's interesting that the, the, the ceramics, although still lagging behind polymers and metals, is a technology that needs to be, um, to be watched carefully. So what is happening in AM? Well, I, I, you know, for the last 30 years, the primary use of AM has been towards prototyping and research. But we are now genuinely moving from prototyping into production. And it's already been mentioned that some sectors have already spearheaded that development, particularly the medical and dental sectors, where from some companies, additive manufacturing is the preferred choice. It is the way you make these parts. Um, and that's really important because it shows also the way forwards for the, the next tier, the next round of companies um, who want to exploit AM. AM does bring significant opportunities, but it also um, has major risks associated with it. With a, with a prototype part, many of you um, on the call of using Objectify to make prototype parts and have been for, for several years. Once a prototype has been tested and used in its, its process, it, it, it then, it's then has no value and, is, in, 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 and uh, is forgotten about. However, with a production part, you own that production part, you have responsibility for that production part for the full life of, of whatever it goes into. So this may be a 10 year or even 20 year link between the part you've made and your customer. And that brings significant challenges. So I've listed some of the challenges. I don't want to put you off because you, I presume that most people on the call are avid AM users or certainly uh, are interested in additive manufacturing. However, it would be fair to say that part cost particularly the metal parts, is high. And that's linked to relatively low productivity levels, uh, failed builds, and also scrap parts. But that situation is improving. New technology is coming through. We're already seeing that every two or three years, the cost of AM parts is dropping. And I think in the first five years, the last five years, we've had a halving of the cost of metal AM parts. As productivity has improved, um, in the machines and also the process becomes streamlined and also failed builds are reducing because the machine is getting more reliable and also because in process monitoring has been placed inside the machines they're no longer operating blind and scrap parts are being reduced because we are starting to understand how to design for the process and set the process up correctly to limit the chance of fail bills, but however, there's still plenty of work to be done in, in improving um, the, the, the level of defective parts. Of course, it's a new technology, so there's lack of experience. So, you know, it's, it's, you can't compare it with casting, where we have several thousand years of experience of casting. AM is new, you know, and, and so we're still learning about the process as one colours mentioned you know there's a fundamental science in some cases is still not understood but we can't wait until everything is understood we need to get going and then as we move forwards and as the science um, helps us we can then start to improve the processes and optimize the parameters another thing that some of you will have seen is the the unconventional nature of part designs for AM. They're not, they don't, you know, design for AM utilizing some packages generates some fairly unusual um, component shapes. However, this, this is important. We have to break away from thinking about the sort of prismatic parts that we're used to as engineers, which have largely been dictated by previous conventional manufacturing processes and let, let our imagination run because some of these unconventional designs, although seem um, rather exotic, work really well and they're highly optimized. And they also improve the build speed and cost of parts by reducing the amount of material that's being processed. 
There's obviously issues about materials. We don't have the wide range of materials we have for, for casting, but we are improving the number of materials. Um, we need to control feedstock. This is really critical. Um, we can't fill the machines with poor material and expect good parts out. And this is something that I guess most companies have to watch very carefully, particularly for metal AM. And we have unusual properties. What we're getting from, from AM parts is, in many cases, um, better than a casting. But we have to be careful because we do get um, uh, an isotropic properties. We don't have consistent properties in all directions. And that has to be considered in the end use application. And finally, we're dealing with really complex parts in the main. When we design them, we can, we can integrate components. We can make complex components, but that makes them difficult to finish and difficult to inspect. And without, unless we can inspect a part, then we can't use it. So it is challenging. And as already mentioned, there's a lack of AM specific standards and routes to certification, but these are now coming through. So particularly um, supported by activities like the ASTM, AM Center of Excellence. So as mentioned about controlling feedstock, you know, many of the powder bed machines are using a fine metal powder. Um, the powder itself will influence both the process and the component properties. There's batch to batch variation and supply to supply variability, which at the moment, although it has improved, it is still there. And this is a significant concern. And one of the things that the ASTM, uh, AM Centre of Excellence is working on is new standard standards for testing, which allow us to generate more confidence in the materials we're using. And of course, we need to know how much the AM process affects the powders, how it degrades the powder during the process. Can it be reused? One of the critical questions we get at, asked by industry is how many times can I use the powder before I have to retire it? Um, and that's really difficult because it depends on what you're making as well as the powder type. And things like how do we store the powder? You know, does that affect the properties? What can go wrong? Can we get uh, material, um, uh, you know, debris, with it, foreign, foreign um, object debris within the material which then contaminates it and prevents it from being used. So it is, I would say, as part of the process, feedstock is one of the most um, challenging parts of, of the metal AM process and must not be overlooked. So within the ASTM AM Center of Excellence, um, you know, we've got a lot of work going on to support standards. We've got the projects funded by STM. Um, we've also got core research projects funded by our members to develop new standards. So they're using their own money to develop standards for the greater good of the whole of the, um, uh, of the industrial sectors. We also have European projects, UK funded projects, the work we're doing with ESA and existing standards activities. And one thing that's really important now is that when we run a research project to develop a new process or new material, we're thinking about the standards whilst we're actually running those projects. We, the projects don't think about standards as, a, as a, a secondary issue, but are thinking about standards from the, from the get-go. Um, I want to mention a bit about, about how the research community can help. And one of the things that we need to do within the research community, as well as developing new processes, materials, and the underpinning science is to help the, the help the technology move up the technology readiness level scale so at the moment if you look at the research area generally speaking we get to technology technology readiness level three and it's an experimental proof of concept but industry can't use it until we get to seven which is a proven process demonstrated in an operational environment and that value of death is that light blue area which is not easy, it's not simple, and is quite a different approach to most university research. Um, it's about refining and fixing parameters. 
and then validating the process and part performance and then transferring that into industry, including training. So it's, 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 this is an important way the research community can help. Here's an example of that where we work with Rolls-Royce. Um, we did a project which was to develop um, uh, a process for making uh, these uh, 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 um, sector state of components um, here that are each individual electron beam um, melted and then welded together to form this ring of veins. And the original, original process parameters uh, were developed by Sheffield University. And then we continued to make parts, testing the robustness of the process for almost two years, making parts to understand how, how robust the process was before Rolls-Royce could use it in, in, in production. So one thing I would say is become an intelligent customer, keep informed. So today's session is really good. It's, I, 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 I uh, really thank Objectify for setting up this webinar. Um, we need to network and share information with other users. We need to participate in collaborative research programs to share the cost and reduce the risk. And also carefully plan your journey. Choose the right part. It has to be appropriate for AM. Um, otherwise, there's no point. You, you, you'll end up with a, a result that doesn't really work. It's, and then take small steps to reduce the risk. Use an example from Boeing or GE, where they started with a small component, simple components, and then slowly built up experience and confidence. But also understand the bigger picture. You can only get the full benefits of AM by designing for the process. Um, if you're using existing design, you will not be able to get the full uh, commercial benefit. Here's some of the sectors that are using AM. I will quickly say that the, the usual ones we'd expect, aerospace, space, medical, power generation, motorsport and defense. And interestingly, in terms of applications, prototyping is by far the greatest application at the moment. But it should, we shouldn't overlook things like manufacturing aids, things like jigs and fixtures and tooling. End components is still in many sectors, some way off. And this is an example from in jigs and fixtures. Um, this is, many of the examples come from the automotive industry, where making jigs and fixtures, it's, it's an expensive, tends to be a, 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 an activity that is the last pros part of a process um, before you start production. So often it's under significant time pressure. And anti-manufacturing offers a really good way of making complex fixtures, which are also lightweight as well. So making it less um, effort for operators to move them around um, a, a production facility. I'm getting to the end of the presentation. Um, AM, collab AM collaborative projects are really critical. Um, and these are some examples of the ones that we're involved with. Um, and I'll give you an example of just one project which shows you how we can take technology forward for, for industry. This is the drama project, and it's really about helping the aerospace supply chain um, exploit additive manufacturing. Big companies like Airbus and Rolls-Royce really don't need this support, but, but the smaller companies uh, do require support because for them, the cost of getting it wrong is too great. So uh, drama is set up uh, a UK uh, a facility and also tools to help UK supply chain get a competitive advantage in the aerospace and actually manufacturing um, sector. And these are the project partners, we've got ourselves, um, ATS, who, who, who are involved in, in, in manufacturing systems, Autodesk, um, Granta, who you may know, who provide um, material property information, uh, the Midlands Aerospace Alliance, uh, Renny Shaw, who make AM machines, uh, the Nas National Physics Laboratory, who is a little bit like NIST in the, the USA. Um, they have some great uh, technology for measurement and the University of Birmingham. And then we also have an industrial steering group who involves some of the bigger companies because what we want is for those companies to buy into our solution. We've built a brand new facility that demonstrates the whole of the process from design 
powder testing and control, a range of different AM platforms, uh, post-processing inspection, and it's effectively a reconfigurable factory. So companies can come in and test their product through this factory to see if it works. They don't have to buy any equipment, and it, so the risk is relatively low, and also they can use our expertise as well. And it helps them answer the, some of these critical questions. You know, I think the first question is, do I need AM? Is AM really something important to me? And then probably, how do I get the method approved by my customers? Because if you can't get the method approved by your customers, you're wasting your time. And then think about what sort of capability, what sort of technology, and, and how should I lay out my factory? And this is something we can do through this, this, this facility. We also are taking knowledge that we're generating from the facility and sharing it across the world through our knowledge hub. So this contains why um, this knowledge hub is a, um, uh, uh, contains information on, on the uh, white papers on, on how to set up part bills, how to finish components, heat treatment, all sorts of technology and it's free to access for companies. And finally, we to bring it all together. This, is, this, this infographic is really to show what AM in industry should look like if it's brought together properly, starting with materials. You know, how do we validate the material uh, su su selection supply and how do we control all of the elements of powder handling and reuse? So all of those issues of material. And then, you know, design for AM, you know, choice of software, the, the knowledge of how to use it, um, optimizing the data flows and design to exploit that, de that information effectively. Um, and then uh, information on the AM um, process, how to get optimized build strategies to give reliable builds. And then all of the work around post-processing to ensure that parts are, are fit for use. And then there's also issues around factory implementation, how do we design the factory for a smooth streamlined flow of parts and also health and safety as well, that's really critical. Some of these metal powders are both flammable um, and toxic to the user, so we're very careful that we, how we deal with powders. And then also, how do we draw data from the machines so that we can continuously monitor, control, and also improve the processes. So I would say if one takeaway is have this as your aspiration. If you're going to get into an AM, um, think about the whole system to maximize the benefit for your company. And of course, work with partners um, you know, your, your, and also your customers to ensure that what you're doing can be commercialized. And uh, over to questions. I'm sorry, I slightly overran. Um, no problem. Thank you, David, for the lovely presentation. Um, we have some questions coming in. Um, so I'll just start with the questions. Um, so there was a question about how do you think the basic scientific research from academia can be most effectively translated to procedures and practices for the industry to develop commercial applications? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. So uh, what I see happening at the moment, because we, what we'd, in an ideal world, we'd have, we'd have the, every process thoroughly understood, thoroughly optimized, and then we start to use it we can't afford to wait. So what we have to do to utilize the process in industry is to take the current state of development and then lock it down, lock those, that development down and those parameters down. S develop the route through to certification and then utilize that to make a commercial benefit. And then as new developments move forwards, we then have to use that for new products or we have to unlock what we've done. One of the biggest challenges 
is that once you've gone through the process of certifying a material and a process for an application, it's so expensive. It's not so easy just to then say, oh, well, there's a new, a new process, a new improvement. Let's utilize that because you're throwing away potentially millions of pounds of investment. So it has to be to some extent that as you exploit, you lock down the process. And that does make it challenging. It doesn't mean there's a continuous drip feed of, of new technology and new developments into production. Um, what happens is, is that the next the next round of products can exploit the new technology. The current round of products has to, to be stuck with the existing technique. So it is a, it's a little bit like a, a start stop. In, in terms of, of, of um, aligning research to commercial needs, the most important thing is for academia and industry to work together. For academics, and I'm an ex-academic, to listen to what industry wants. You know, mm -hmm. what do they really want? They, and then by listening to what industry wants, we can focus our research to address those problems rather than invent problems that don't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and a bit of in continuation to that, you've discussed a lot about the challenges and what the industry should really aim for. Um, could you further elaborate in how a uh, technology innovation partner such as the NTC, how, how necessary it is and how does it play that role of bridging the gap? Yeah, so, so I'll be completely honest that if, if you're, you know, many big companies um, and GE would be a classic example, you know, they don't need an MTC. They, they, they you know, GE have invested um, over 2 billion in additive manufacturing, not only in developing new products that utilize them in the aerospace sector, but also by buying machinery manufacturers, buying software companies. Um, you know, a company, you know, a company like GE, the, the MTC, although may be interesting to them, it isn't critical. But mm -hmm. for many companies who don't have the resources of a GE or a, or a, a, a Boeing, having access to a, um, a competent but also independent partner. Because one of the problems you have in working directly with uh, uh, machine vendors, and it doesn't matter how good they are, they're in the business of selling to you. They're in the business of selling their technology. So as a consequence, even if they don't tell lies, they will have a tendency to withhold information. For us, we will provide to partners, not just, um, you know, we'll, not just great components for them to be evaluated, but, you, but also all the processing parameters and also some of the issue, some of the problems, you know, which, which you won't get from machine vendors, you know, because it's not in their best interest to highlight some of the difficulties. So that's, you know, I, I'm being completely honest with you. If you have, a, if you have resources, then MTC um, is optional. But if you don't have the resources, um, having a research center that can pool knowledge across different sectors, because that's the other thing is working in isolation. An aerospace company doesn't learn from a medical company mm -hmm. by working with a research center that knowledge is pooled across different sectors and it would be great for India to have a, an equivalent to the MTC. I, I think there's some talk about, about, about um, different regions around India having um, equivalent centers and that makes a lot of, a lot of sense to me. Yeah, yeah. And also uh, what you mentioned as an example about ESA partnering with MTC, uh, yeah. that also was a very interesting concept. It was, and I, and I understand why they did it, because they, that what they wanted was a consistent approach to controlling feedstock and, and, and also NDT and, and inspection. Because if you're doing great research around Europe, but you're not controlling the quality of the feedstock or the quality of how the parts you're making are assessed, it's mm -hmm. a fundamental weakness. And so what it was doing is providing some degree of consistency and rigor 
into that process. And, and one thing we're doing at the moment, we have a big project funded by ESA to look at the supply chain for powder to understand why there's variability between different suppliers. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it, that's a really worry to big worry as as production starts to increase in in AM, then we need to make sure that everybody is producing powder to a consistently high quality, but obviously making sure it's still economically viable. Yep. Um, thank you very much, David. Uh, it was a lot of uh, knowledge and a lot of interesting discussions. No problem. Um, um, David, I would now like to pass to Ankit. Yeah, please. Hi, David. Uh, Ankit here. Thank you. Thank you for such an informative presentation you did. And thank you for joining in at such a short notice. So I have a couple of questions from the audience uh, for you, actually. Uh, Deepa Srinivasan from uh, Pratt & Whitney, she has also joined us. And she has a question like, uh, does the center offer funding to universities, other researchers to carry out specific aspect of ongoing projects from TRL five to seven? What, what do the members of consortium interact with the center? It's, it's a great, it's a great question. It's a great question. And again, it, it shows, you know, it, it shows why the aerospace sector, um, you know, we're involved, you know, it has become such a flagship for AM because it's thinking, you know, the full, the full system. So, so in answer to your question, um, we do fund and support. We, we, we're not a funding body. So obviously we, you know, we, we are, we tend to use our own funding to fund our own research projects. However, we are supporting research in universities, particularly PhD projects. So we're funding now over 60 PhD projects around different universities to provide the feed, particularly at TRL one to three, because what we need to do is establish that, that pipeline of new technology. And to do that, we need to be working with universities and sponsoring projects which align to real industry needs that we can see. So that, that's one way of doing that is, is to, to provide the funding. And that's the, that's the incentive to, in, to academia to take on that type of research. It's always a, a challenge in research to come up with industrially exploitable but highly novel research, but that's that's a challenge which we which I think can be met. Um, so so yes, we are funding funding um, projects, and we're also collaborating. Some of our projects we've just finished a a big European um, funded project, and that had fourteen partners, um, some of which were were academic partners. So we we also collaborate heavily with the academics uh, community to try and um, help them to fund their research but also to help commercialize it yes um, so i would like to just tell everyone who who is attending today uh, dr wimpney has a great uh, uh, interest with the indian uh, am industry because most of his student as brigu is uh, who is questioning him he's uh, one of the uh, student of dr wimpney and i'm from uh, university of warwick where dr wimpney was Professor there, so his his involvement involvement with the Indian AM industry is quite immense, and uh, he has been involved with several uh, research institutes within the country also, and uh, he has been helping all all the students till now. Uh, Dr. Wimpy, I have one of your friend uh, who has joined us, uh, Carl. Carl, are you there? Hi, David. How are Hello. You? I'm okay. Hello. Thank you. Can you hear okay. me? So I can I, hear you well. Strange times. No, I would. Good I, grief! I, this is yes. this is this is like um, I'm trying to say. It's a little bit like um, uh, um, a Christmas Carol, <laughs> and and Carl has come in the ghost. <laughs> as the ghost of Christmas, <laughs> Christmas past. past. <laughs> um, in a nice way, Carl. It's <laughs> lovely to hear from you. So, so Carl. So well, Carl I, is. I, I, I don't know. If, for those on the call, Carl is. Um, you know, Carl's really um, made um, material solutions, which is now part of Siemens, what it is today. Um, and, and that requires a vision 
and an awful lot of hard work. Um, and uh, and I hope is in, you're enjoying your your um, post post material solutions um, uh, life, shall we say? Grant, I was I was I was going to say, David. Um, uh, I was in the same position as Objectify for about ten years, and there seems to me to be quite a lot of tension between um, people asking for standards and yet requiring their own special source. I mean, we always seem to have to have too many requirements to meet and, and different from different people. So Rolls Royces was different from GEs. There was just a plethora of, of, of I mean, even things like uh, test bars. I mean, God knows how many different test bars shapes and sizes there were to machine for materials testing um chemistry i mean I, I i think people completely missed the 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 requirement for for the correct chemistry for additive people used to people used to think they'd given us a specification for a material when they'd given us a a, a very hazy sort of uh, casting specification so I, I applaud the 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 the, um, the push for standards, but I would also uh, push for there to be genuine standards rather yeah. than yet another requirement to be met. You know, over and above, say NADCAP and, and we're, vendors. We're, at all, we're all a little. Yeah, I agree with you, Carl. We're all a bit frustrated at having to apply a different set of conditions on the shop floor, depending on who the customer is. Uh, let's face it no customer wants bad parts there's no there's no there's no diversity in between between customers in what they want it's just that each one has a slightly precious view of how important they are interestingly with a, with ASTM we've been working with NASA to take their internal space standard and develop a more uh, develop a generic general standard to how you control the end process and that is the right approach rather than rather than rather than having a standard for space and the standard for everybody else it's, it's it's often cheaper just to work to one standard even if it's a little bit more exacting than having to manage a facility where you've got five or six different so we say quality of components being in in, um, in in circulation because it's bound to end in tears so if we can come up with common standards it would make a a significant benefit for the industry it would just make it clear for everybody but as you know some of the bigger players particularly the aerospace players like to enforce their own particular standards even when it costs them more money to do so yeah the, the other thing that i haven't heard um uh emphasize i suppose is with heat treatments and the control of heat yeah. treatments yeah i mentioned it very briefly but you're absolutely right i mean we get so we get so fixated about the AM process, and yes, it can go wrong. But the number of times when parts have been scrapped through inappropriate heat treatment, um, you know, I think the heat treatment um, and and particularly the hip or not hip um, question, yeah. you know, is still not being resolved properly. And I think I think um, we, we've got a, a, a guide on heat treatment which includes a bit about hipping and what it will and won't do. And I would love to circulate it more widely. I think it is actually on the, um, on the uh, knowledge hub and it will answer that question, you know, why is my parts that have been hipped when I take them through a, a subsequent heat treatment cycle, suddenly all of the porosity opens up again. You know, it, it, it's, it's the, the, the laws of heat treatment don't change just because we're using additive manufacturing, you know. It's it's um, it, we 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 forget that 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 lots of things we're relying on have been around for many years, and we have a tendency to overlook that knowledge. I think. Anyway, good luck. Yeah. Yes, and good luck to you. I didn't know you were Thank in you. India. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on, on the west coast of India, in Europe. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Thank you, thank you, Carl. Thank you, David. Thank you for the lovely interaction between you two. Uh, and um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Khalid Rafi, uh, Dr. Alex Liu, uh, for joining in from ASTM and sharing their information. They have been answering a lot of questions on uh, on the portal itself. 
and uh, they have i think completed all the answers already and thank you thank you uh, dr alex uh, thank you dr vimpni for such a lovely information what you provided our audience with and uh, looking forward uh, to have more interactions with you let's hope so we're all we're all looking to return to some sort of more normal life um, perhaps not in the near future but but uh, you know perhaps sometime next year thank you thank dr you. david yeah, thank you thank Take you care. kids thank you thank you dr alex Bye to all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Yeah, so we'd like to end the presentation right now. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in. I would like to thank Tagma India for being our set partner as well as Manufacturing Tech Update. Uh, uh, thank you everyone. We'll be sharing with you a report after this, uh, after a couple of days. And uh, thank you everyone. Uh, have a nice day and uh, stay safe. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.